Last week, we heard about the calling of Jesus' first disciples from the point of view of the book of John. And because John is sometimes hard to follow, we acted it out. You remember that? That was fun. Well, today, we hear about the same event from a slightly different point of view, that of the book of Matthew. Now, Matthew's point of view is slightly more descriptive. We believe that Jesus' first disciples caught fish for a living, but we don't learn that from reading the same story in the book of John. In Matthew, the reality hits us right between the eyes. We are told that Peter and Andrew are casting a net into the sea when Jesus calls to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, are mending fishing nets with their father when Jesus calls to them. Matthew got this version from the book of Mark, which scholars believe was the first written gospel. The words are almost identical, down to the use of one of Mark's favorite words, and guess what it is? Immediately. Okay, everything happens immediately in the book of Mark. And because Matthew lifted this text directly from Mark, we get some of Mark's fast-paced energy in the description of their actions. I can almost see Andrew and Peter concentrating on their work, the muscles working over and over, rippling smoothly beneath the sun tanned skin. I guess I should have written it. As the men cast their nets and draw them in full of fish, I think you can see it too. I can just see James and John and their father Zebedee also tying knots as they repair the nets they use for every day. And then Jesus calls them. Both of the pairs of brothers drop what they're doing and immediately leave their work behind to follow Jesus. Now, to my modern imagination, immediately is a strange word to use here. Immediately would be like four robots hearing a command rather than an invitation, dropping what they're doing and never questioning that command. But they are not robots. These are very human men leaving behind our custom work in order to follow Jesus. I might imagine one of them becoming clumsy in his haste to follow, and his brother becoming a little irritated at his clumsiness. And can't you just imagine Zebedee, who might have had a bit of a temper, his sons were known after all as the sons of thunder, getting to his feet and calling after his sons, hey, we're in the middle of work here. Where do you think you're going? But they've been blinded by Jesus' great light, and their lives will never be the same again. They don't know where they're going. But it's sure to be nothing like they've experienced before. And Matthew quotes Isaiah with a little difference. In Isaiah, it's the people who walked in darkness who have seen the great light. In Matthew, it's the people who sat in darkness who have seen the great light. It seems that whether we do more walking or sitting, God's great light comes to us in Jesus. Both the brothers who were striding from one end of the boat to the other, hauling in fish, and the brothers sitting as they concentrated on mending their nets. They move as one, unified in the purpose of the one who calls them. Now in our reading from 1 Corinthians, we have a unique text. It seems like it could have been written by someone today. In our world, we have differences everywhere we look. Unity is hard to find. We have schisms within families, communities, and denominations. And we have arguments that lead people sometimes to leave and join another congregation, sometimes to stay at home and nurse very real wounds. I can imagine Paul saying us today, saying to us today, what I mean is that each of you says, and listen carefully, I belong to the Protestant tradition, or I belong to Canterbury, or I belong to Rome. Has Christ been divided? Was Thomas Aquinas crucified for you? Are we baptized in the name of John Calvin? That makes it a little clearer for us. And the implied answer to all these questions, like the questions in the text, is, of course, no. 
Christ has not been divided. We are founded and centered on Christ, the crucified and risen victim. Our unity lies in the foolishness of the cross. One theologian says that the word foolishness is more accurately translated a vulgar joke. So Paul, in that sense, would be saying, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power, for the message about the cross is a vulgar joke to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I'm sure you know people who say, I just can't understand why Jesus was crucified if he was God's son. I just can't believe in God who would do such a thing. But what Jesus' crucifixion says about God, as Nadi Holtz Weber says so eloquently, is that the cross is where God is. God allowed us to crucify the Son so that we might repent of our tendencies to divide and scapegoat others, and instead to worship the one who forgives us. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near, Jesus says. We're not an evangelical church that spends a lot of time calling for repentance, but we surely recognize the vulgar joke that makes us fall to our knees, knowing that we are no better than those who crucify him. And the confession that results from hearing the gospel brings us to the absolution. The statement that we are forgiven and we are reconstituted in a community around the forgiving victim once again. Theologian Paul Neuterlein says, Thus, if Jesus comes to save us, he doesn't just save us as individuals. He must save us also by founding a new community based on something else. He founds us based on a life of fighting the temptations to rivalry, a life of doing God's will, God's desire, without rivalry. In other words, the life of the Trinity, the Godhead, which is itself a community. He also saves us by founding community on the basis of the risen victim who is recognized as innocent. It is community founded around the rehabilitation of victims, but instead of the making of them. Now that's profound. Let me say it again. I wanted to make sure you heard it. It is community founded around the rehabilitation of victims instead of the making of them. Divisions and quarrels are often caused by having to make distinctions between things. And fake news and outright lies are also hard to escape these days. But maybe this will help. Martin Luther, in his small catechism, speaks of each of the Ten Commandments. Each explanation starts with the words, we are to fear and love God. <clears throat> different denominations number them differently, another distinction between us. But the commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, which Episcopal and most Protestant churches list as the ninth commandment, but which Roman Catholic and Lutheran churches list as the eighth, says this. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. What does this mean for us? We are to fear and love God so that we do not betray, slander, or lie about our neighbors, but defend them, speak well of them, and explain their actions in the kindest way. That might be one to remember, especially the part about explaining their actions in the kindest way. I know I fail at that all the time. I need the help of my Lord to stop doing that, and maybe you do too. Because I belong to whomever is one way to distinguish ourselves from others, and it often leads to not explaining their actions in the kindest way. However, if we say only, I belong to Christ, then we're also reminded that we are some of the ones who have sat or walked in darkness. A 
but now we see a great light. We, like Peter and Andrew and James and John, are also called to follow that great light, that we might be united in the same mind and with the same purpose. Living in the light of love, the light of forgiveness, the light of humility, as we leave behind our old lives every day and follow in the way of the gospel with all its astonishing power.